You're watching Beyond 100 Days. 50 years ago, America shot for the moon. It was a triumph of technology and a feat of politics. The US flag planted on the lunar surface became a defining image of the Cold War. Five, four, three, two, one, all engines running. And with those famous words, the voyage began, changing our understanding of space and our lives back on Earth. And we're live in Cape Canaveral, where that historic launch took place, hearing just what it was like to be on board. Democrats prepare a resolution condemning Donald Trump's attacks of four members of Congress. Republicans will now have to decide how they are going to vote. Also on the programme, in the past few minutes, Germany's Defence Minister Ursula von der Leyen has been confirmed as the new European Commission President. And the medical team from the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, who have separated with some extraordinary skill the conjoined twins Marwa and Safa. We will speak to one of the surgeons. Hello, I'm Katty Kay in Washington. Christian Fraser is in London. On this day, 50 years ago, three men got into a rocket with no idea if they would ever return to Earth. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins were the trio tasked with humanity's inaugural flight to the moon. They were Americans, but the whole world watched with amazement. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Four days after liftoff and 240,000 miles later, the Eagle begins its descent to the moon. But then an alarm sounds and with just minutes to go until the landing, the computer crashes. Neil Armstrong has to take manual control to land the spacecraft safely. And then those famous words. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, half a century on, the Apollo moon program is probably still humankind's single greatest technological event. Jane O'Brien is at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, where the launch took place, of course. We've been talking about the astronauts, but really, in a way, the hero of the day is the space shuttle itself, isn't it, Jane? Well, I'm so glad you said that, Caddy, because it's all about the Saturn V rocket, one of which is right behind me. And this is the closest I've ever been to something this big that flies through the air. And as you can see, it is vast. It's actually taller than the Statue of Liberty. When it's full of fuel, it weighs a whopping 6.2 million pounds. It has a thrust of 7.5 million pounds. And at top speed, it flies at seven miles a second. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, Look at this over there. The United States logo is on the capsule, the module that the astronauts sat in when that powerful rocket was blasting off from the Earth. So when you hear Michael Collins say that, you know, he was slightly worried about the second stage detachment, you can see why. That is tiny. They were so vulnerable. It was so fragile. The bravery of those men just absolutely blows my mind. What must it have been like? And they had control in that little cockpit there. I was listening uh, today to Michael Collins, Jane, and he said it was like uh, a nervous novice driving a heavy goods vehicle down a narrow alley as he tried to manoeuvre it away from the launch tower. At every stage in this journey, something could have gone wrong. Well, absolutely, because, of course, this was, by definition, the first time that anybody had actually tried to put men on the, on the moon. And I've also been talking to people who witnessed it. Um, they've come back here today, some of them, to, to relive that moment 50 years ago. The closest they could get was three and a half miles away, because although it was most dangerous on board, you couldn't get any closer because the, the shock wave of those engines going off would have killed you. So most people who witnessed the takeoff were actually three and a half miles back from the actual launch site. It was only the engineers and absolutely essential staff, presumably wearing protective clothing, who were allowed that close. Um, so all round, what a mission, what a day to be here where it actually happened 50 years ago. Okay, 
Jane O'Brien, Dan in Cape Canaveral, pretty good day to be there too as well today. Well, one of the surviving crew members, Michael Collins, says that his mission 50 years ago was one of the most significant moments of the 20th century. As you ascend very slowly, majestically inside, it's a different situation. You feel jiggling left to right and uh, you're not quite sure whether those jiggles are as big or small as they should be or how much closer they're going to put you to that launch umbilical tower which you do not very much want to hit right that moment. So it's a totally uh, different feeling at liftoff uh, um, the, the, the nervous novice driving a wide vehicle down a narrow alley. There is that great quote. Fantastic. In Washington, the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence unveiled to the world today Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. It hasn't been publicly seen for 13 years. Fragile, of course. It's been carefully restored at the cost of thousands of dollars, paid for through public donations. It's now on display on a mannequin at Washington National Air and Space Museum in a state-of-the-art display case there to protect it. Very cool. Well, one man that knows a fair deal about that suit, among other things, is Douglas Brinkley. He's a historian and the author of the book American Moonshot, John F. Kennedy and the Great Space Race. He joins us now from Austin, Texas. Uh, Douglas, thanks very much for joining us. I guess in now it seems inevitable that the mission took place at all and that it succeeded. But if John F. Kennedy hadn't decided to make space a, an integral part of his battle in the Cold War, would Americans have got to the moon? No, no John F. Kennedy, no going to the moon, at least not in mm. 1969. Uh, Kennedy sped the whole thing up. Uh, it was a $25 billion Apollo project. It had bipartisan support. Today that would be around $170, $80 billion to go to the moon. And John F. Kennedy was a great space salesperson. He would go all over and talk about we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard, and made sure that it got appropriations. And there were Mercury astronauts before Apollo, and there were six space missions during Kennedy's presidency, and all six were successful, John Glenn being the, the great hero of those. Oh, and why? Why did he think, given how much was going on down here on Earth in terms of the Cold War and the division of powers around the world, what was it about getting a man on the moon that made him so convinced that this was a way to show America's preeminence in the Cold War. Kennedy's big thing was how do we leapfrog the Soviets with their technology? The United States and Great Britain were caught off guard that the Soviet Union had the atomic bomb in 1949, then the hydrogen bomb, then Russia had the world's first ICBM missile, the R-7, and then they put the first satellite up into space with Sputnik. And then they put the first creature in space with their dog Laika, and then the first human in space with Yuri Gagarin. And the United States felt like they were losing the space race. So Kennedy said, let's leapfrog them. We can do a satellite to satellite or astronaut to cosmonaut, but let's go big and aim for the moon. And when he made his famous address on May 25th, 1961 to Congress, he shocked everybody. Kennedy's own father uh, called the White House, where's Jack? Gosh darn, I knew he'd do something reckless and idiotic like this. <laughs> and people at NASA and, uh, said there's no technology to go to the moon. Why, why is the President of the United States putting that much credence and credibility on a moonshot? But Kennedy was visionary, science was popular, and he thought it would lift the American spirit. And even after John F. Kennedy was murdered in Dallas in November of 1963, the U.S. funded Apollo as sort of a legacy to him. And alas, you just were broadcasting from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Douglas, I know you, you spoke to so many of the people that were involved in the event that day. What was it like in the firing room? I mean, they'd been Apollo 9 and Apollo 10, they'd been around the moon, but were they absolutely confident they could land someone on the surface? They were not absolutely confident. Uh, Apollo 1 was a disaster in 1967 when we lost three astronauts, Ed White, Gus Grissom, and Roger Chafee, and the head of NASA had to re resign James Webb. And so I interviewed Neil Armstrong for my book before he died, and he said they thought he had a 50-50 chance of success. 
uh, 50 years ago. Now, I don't mean that they would have died, but that this would actually have worked. If it was one maneuver wrong, one second wrong, things could have gone sideways. It's, uh, it's one of the miracles of modern times that uh, Paul Levin worked largely without a hitch. Okay, Douglas Brinkley, it's lovely to get your thoughts mm -hmm. and, and to look back on uh, the event. Thank you very much for being with us. I was thinking, Cathy, early today that when they look back in 500 years' time, a lunar walk might not sound that impressive. Perhaps they've already started to go further beyond in space and to Mars and goodness knows what. But it's very likely that this moment will be seen as the most significant event of the 20th century. And I wonder whether you could do it again right now, the amount of money that they piled into it in that, at that time. It's been interesting to hear Buzz Aldrin over the last, you know, say, over the last years, we've t it's taken 50 years and we haven't done it again. And he's kind of angered by the fact, given how far we've advanced in technology, you might think that it was possible. But I think you get to the right point, which is that we heard Douglas Brinkley say there, this was a massive federal expenditure. It was the US Congress opening its purse strings. And it's very hard to see that happening again. Maybe it's because there is no common enemy, because we're not in the middle of the Cold War, um, because there is this reluctance to feel that government should spend on big projects like that. I mean, if you look at the space exploration now, it's in the private sector, it's commercial companies that are doing space exploration, and it's not here in the United States. It's the Chinese who are landing on the far side of the moon, which hasn't been done uh, before with a probe. So that's where it's happening. It's not happening at a U.S. And government federal level. That and I think that's a reflection of, of the attitude of, of the country at the moment. And it's extraordinary to think that they've not done it. When, when they started in 1960, they had no knowledge at all. I mean, we know so much mm. about space now. I mean, when they mm. set off in the 1960s, they didn't know if they could land on the surface, whether the craft would sink. They didn't know whether the dust would explode mm. when they got back into the cockpit. They didn't even know whether it was carrying pathogens. They stuck the astronauts in a, a room with white mice when they got back to Earth, just in case there was something wrong with the, with the moon dust. So it seems extraordinary that they've not done it since, but there we are. Yeah, we know so much, but we haven't been back to the moon. Uh, crashing down now to Earth, I'm afraid, and the latest US politics. In the past half hour, Donald Trump has repeated his attacks on four Democratic congresswomen from minority backgrounds, saying the women hate their country. As Democrats prepare to vote on a ref resolution condemning the president, he himself has been fanning the controversy again, tweeting about it no less than seven times today. Uh, those tweets were not racist, he said. I don't have a racist bone in my body. The so-called vote to be taken is a Democrat con game. Republicans should not show weakness and fall into their trap. This should be a vote on the filthy language, statements and lies told by the Democrat congresswomen who I truly believe, based on their actions, hate our country. Get a list of the horrible things they have said. Omar is polling at 8%, Cortez at 21%, Nancy Pelosi tried to push them away, but now they are forever wedded to the Democrat Party. See you in 2020. And then he had this to say at a cabinet meeting just a short time ago. I think it's terrible when people speak so badly about our country, when people speak so horribly. I have a list of things here. I'm not going to bore you with it because you would be bored. You wouldn't write it anyway. But I have a list of things here say, said by uh, the Congresswomen that is so bad, so horrible, that I almost don't want to read it. It's my opinion they hate our country. And that's not good. It's not acceptable. OK, we're joined now by our North America correspondent, Nick Bryant. Nick, thanks um, for joining us. It seems to me that the key phrase, if you want to understand the motivation of all of this for Donald Trump in that tweet, is that phrase, see you in 2020. Is this all an election strategy for him? These tweet attacks are a matter of political calculation, no question at all. He is trying to map out the battle lines ahead of next year's presidential election. And I dare say he is pretty happy right now with how the politics of this racial row are turning out and playing out because what he wants to do is make those non-white congresswomen the face of the modern day Democratic Party. Uh, he wants the Democratic leadership to rally round uh, those women. Uh, so he creates an enemy ahead of next year. Now race has always been at the heart of Donald Trump's political business model. He made his political name uh, through birtherism, claiming falsely that Barack Obama was not born in the United States of America. He opened his 2016 campaign with an attack on Mexican immigrants. And this is what he is essentially doing now. He's putting race at the heart of the campaign and returning 
uh, to a political business model that worked last time and what he thinks will work this time too. Uh, Nick, there's going to be a vote in the House of Representatives in a few hours' time. Nancy Pelosi trying to get the Republicans to put on record for perpetuity how they view Donald Trump's tweets. Yeah, and it's worth saying that uh, more than a dozen Republicans have come out and criticized Donald Trump, not least uh, Senator Tim Scott. He's an African-American senator from South Carolina, the only African-American Republican senator. But crucially, the Republican leadership has not criticized Donald Trump. Indeed, uh, many in the Republican leadership have actually uh, backed him up. And that shows how uh, in lockstep now the Republican leadership is with Donald Trump. Um, you know, a few years ago, uh, Lindsey Graham, the senator, another senator from South Carolina, uh, the great friend of John McCain, was criticizing Donald Trump. When he ran against him in 2016, he said he was a race baiter. Uh, well, he's been one of the biggest defenders of Donald Trump uh, during this period. And uh, it just shows how, you know, Donald Trump is making people choose sides. And that, again, is one of the, the, the intentions of, of, of this whole row. Nick Bryan, thanks for being with us. Uh, Nick Bryant there in Washington. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen has been confirmed by the EU's parliament as the next president of the European Commission. 383 MEPs voted to approve her nomination, only nine more than was necessary for it to pass. Yeah, and a last-ditch bid for the support of MEPs, the centre-right German Defence Minister this morning pledged a Green New Deal for Europe and to further extend the UK's departure from the EU if that proved necessary. Mrs van der Leyen will replace Jean-Claude Juncker on November the 1st, becoming the first woman appointed to the EU's top role. Here she was speaking to European lawmakers just a few moments ago. The trust you placed in me is confidence you placed in Europe. Your confidence in a united and a strong Europe, from east to west, from south to north. Well, let's go to uh, speak to Damien Grammaticus. He's the BBC's Europe correspondent. He joins us from uh, Strasbourg, where the vote took place. Uh, it was a secret ballot, Damien, so it wasn't an easy one to predict. And there were some fears that maybe she wouldn't get a majority. No, and as we saw there, she just scraped past that 50% level that she had to pass. She got 52% of the votes, but of that 750 member chamber right here, over 300 voted against her. And that, I think, is going to be a source of some real difficulty for Ursula von der Leyen. So European leaders will be breathing a real sigh of relief now, Christian, because they were not certain she would get through. They had struggled to come up with her name as a package of, of top jobs. She is there, but the question will be, has she had to rely on some votes that she would rather not do? So there we're talking uh, Eurosceptic right-wing MEPs. She was trying to appeal to the sort of pro-EU left parties, but she might not have really got those votes. It might have been others that got her through. OK, Damien Grammaticus in Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Yeah, an awful lot she's going to have to deal with. She takes over on November the 1st and Brexit will, in theory, have happened on October the 31st, as was Italy, Eastern Europe too, a lot on her plate. Um, Scotland has overtaken America as the worst place in the world for drug overdoses. As a percentage of the population, more people die from drugs in Scotland than in America or in any other European country. Uh, there were 1,187 drug-related deaths in Scotland last year. The death rate is nearly three times that of the UK as a whole and a 27% increase on last year. And it seems that the effort being made to tackle the problem might in the end be actually making things worse. Methadone, the heroin substitute prescribed by the NHS to help heroin users, caused more deaths than the drug it is meant to replace and contributed to nearly half of those recorded drug deaths. Just before we came on air, we spoke to Professor Catriona Matheson, the chair of the Scottish Drug Deaths Task Force. Katrina, what is it that is killing so many people in Scotland? Well, when we look at the drugs that are being taken um, and the nature of drug use in Scotland, there's a pattern of drug use, um, which we describe as polydrug use, but it's basically taking more than one substance. So we might have something, an opiate like heroin, um, but also being used with other drugs such as benzodiazepines like diazepam, and also cocaine is featuring more, which of course is a stimulant. So using a stimulant as well as those sedative drugs 
really does provide yeah. a fair leap. So like a cocktail uh, of drugs. It, it's the sheer it scale of the problem, though, and the fact that things are getting worse that is the concern here. So what yeah. kind of solutions and methods are you in favour of to tackle the problem? So we have to get more people into treatment. People are, uh, in Scotland, we don't have enough. We only have about 40% roughly of, of drug users in treatment, and that's, um, that's too low. So we need to get treatment services so that they're easier to access and people can, can you know, they're more appropriate for the, the types and natures of, of drug use. That's one aspect. The other aspect is around stigma of drug use and people who have maybe are long-term drug users and who have um, multiple health problems are stigma, feel stigmatised about going for medical help. And the third point is to look at diverting people away from the criminal justice system. So people talk about decriminalisation, but also just diversion so that there's other diverting people into treatment rather than going to prison or into education and support programmes rather than going to prison. Professor Matheson, the, the big drug epidemic here in the United States with opioids began in the early 2000s uh, with prescription drugs like OxyContin. It, it looks to mm. me like the figures in Scotland have spiked much more recently. Between 2017 and 2018, the deaths rose by almost one third. Do you know why it's what triggered this spike in the last few years? Um, we think there's a number of things at play and we, there's more research to be done to disentangle some of it. But what we think is at play here is partly in what we call an ageing cohort. So people who started drug use in the 80s um, and early 90s who are reaching an age now where they're ageing prematurely, but still using drugs in the, in the way we've already described, using multiple drugs. We're seeing increased in um, what we're calling street Valium, which is... Um, a type of benzodiazepine. There's one called etizolam, which is featuring, and that's an illegal um, sedative, which is, you know, looks like it's being particularly problematic. Okay, Professor Catriona Matheson, thank you very much for joining us. Those figures from Scotland, amazing. I think a lot of people will be surprised. You know, we focus so much on the drug epidemic here in the United States. But look at these numbers. Back in 2018, the number of people in America, 217 people dying of drug overdose per million of the population. And there it is. This is where Scotland has leapfrogged the United States. 218 people dying in Scotland as uh, a proportion of a million of the mm. population, so which many... puts Scotland ahead of the US and, of course, any other European country. And so many of those dying at home from preventable overdoses as well. There has been a move, actually, mm. in Scotland to set up these medically supervised drug consumption rooms, but it's blocked by the, the Home Office because they have charge of the legislation and it would be a breach of the Drug Misuse Act for, for doctors and nurses to get involved in administering drugs. But it might be a solution to some of those deaths if you're there and you can see people taking yeah. it and you can administer that it's being done safely. Anyway, that's one part of the debate. Let's mm. have a look at some of the day's other news. Uh, the budget airline Ryanair says it'll have to cut the number of flights it'll operate next summer because of delays in the delivery of that new Boeing 737 MAX uh, that it had ordered. The airline said it could be as late as December uh, before regulators clear the aircraft to return to the skies after those two fatal crashes. A street in Wales has been named the steepest in the world following a campaign by locals. Ford Penlech, I'm sure I've got that wrong, in the seaside town of Harlech, North Wales, has been officially recorded as being at a gradient of 37%, 2% steeper than the previous record holder in New Zealand, and there was me thinking it was San Francisco all along. <laughs> no no per brakes work. Uh, Spanish police say they've arrested a man at Barcelona airport who had hidden half a kilo of cocaine under his wig. Custom officers noticed that the Colombian was wearing a disproportionately large hairpiece under his hat. <laughs> that happened. Um, last Saturday was a routine trip bump. for Joe Gomez, heading out to the San Francisco Bay Area for a fishing trip with a boat full of customers, armed with a salmon carcass as bait. Hours pass as the group hope for a catch. And then he just feels a bit of a tug on the line. Yeah, we've got something, Joe thinks. And then he tries to reel out the fish and it fails. And then this continues for the best part of an hour as their boat is dragged about while on a light anchor until their catch surfaces. Yep, it's a great white shark. 
six to eight feet long. <laughs> what do you do with that? You don't bring it onto a small boat, of course. Uh, so they cut it free. Uh, the Great White goes back into the water and they return back to San Francisco Bay. A little stunned. Yeah, and, and not much of the salmon left. Do you see not that? Not much uh, of the, the great salmon. Well, just put the smaller <laughs> bait on the hook. That's the solution. <laughs> don't, don't go out with a salmon carcass. Big hook, bait, maybe. big fish. Exactly. That's what uh, happens. Can we can we see it again, Christian? Your little fishing. My little fishing. That was rather. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 It was this big. Okay. Of course it was. Of course it, it was. was. And it actually, actually was that was. big. This is beyond 100 days from uh, the BBC. And coming up for our viewers on the BBC News Channel and on BBC World News, as the Trump racism row rumbles on, we're going to speak to the reporter who is calling for Barack Obama, the former president, to intervene in all of this on behalf of the Democrats. And we are going to talk about the 50th anniversary of the Apollo. We can't get enough of it. 11 launch. We'll hear from a former International Space Station commander and ask if we could have accomplished more in all that time. That's still to come. Good evening. The best of the sunshine today lifted temperatures to 27 degrees, but not all of us had brilliant blue skies like this. This was the scene in Clondidno earlier on, but there was a lot more cloud in other places. That was how it looked in Argyll and Butte. You can see from the earlier satellite picture some speckled cloud. We did have one or two showers during the day. And then behind me here, a more continuous area of cloud. And this is going to bring us some wet weather as we head on into tomorrow. Still some clear skies around though at the moment and as we head through this evening still a chance to see that partial lunar eclipse look towards the southeastern sky and we keep hold of some clear spells as we head deeper into the night but through the small hours we will see quite a lot of cloud into Northern Ireland, Western Scotland, some outbreaks of rain arriving here by the end of the night. The wind's starting to pick up as well. Temperatures overnight generally between 11 and 14 degrees. So we go on into tomorrow and this frontal system is going to bring some soggy weather for some of us. Arriving in Northern Ireland through the first part of the morning, so a pretty disappointing Wednesday morning commute in Belfast. Big puddles, surface water and spray on the roads. That heavy rain getting into western parts of Scotland. Could be the odd flash of lightning, the odd rumble of thunder. Some damp weather then extending across the Irish Sea into western fringes of England and Wales. So by the middle of the afternoon, much of Scotland will be seeing outbreaks of rain. Some brisk southerly winds in association with that frontal system. Something drier and potentially brighter for parts of Aberdeenshire. Rain at the same time beginning to pull away from the western side of Northern Ireland as it extends across the Irish Sea towards Merseyside, northwest England, Wales, the odd spot of rain into the West Midlands and the southwest. Further east, high cloud tending to roll across the skies, the sunshine turning increasingly hazy. It will be another warm day. However, that warmth will be swept away to some extent anyway on Thursday as the last remnants of our frontal system clear eastwards. We're then left with a mix of sunshine and showers, some really heavy showers across the north of the UK and a cooler feel for all of us. Then we head on into Friday. Here comes another area of low pressure, another frontal system. This will bring another dollop of rain even down to the south where it has been pretty dry lately. Brisk winds as well for the weekend, unsettled with some outbreaks of rain at times but not all the time. The latest tech is advancing so fast, it can be hard to keep up. AI might be predicting the fashion of the future. But there's no need to be overwhelmed. Island made up of solar panels. Wow, we're walking on water. This is what it feels like to be on the moon. Just consult the experts. This is how you really do it. Take a look at tomorrow's tech today with Click, Saturday and Sunday at 12.30 on the BBC News Channel. This may be our last chance. I believe we should go to the moon. A woman in mission control was a very big deal. This was not a yellow brick road. How risky is this flight? Seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Three, two, one. Chasing the Moon starts tonight at 8 on BBC Four.
We're not just here to show you these amazing places. But to inspire you. To leave your comfort zone behind. I know they said I'm not going to feel the cold. I just want to get in now. To experience different cultures, secret histories, tantalizing food, delicious, breathtaking landscapes, and hidden gems. So come and join us. It's time to plan your next adventure. Team's arrived. I guess off we go. The Travel Show, Saturday at 10.30. Weekends are different on the BBC News Channel. You're watching Beyond 100 Days. I'm Katty Kay in Washington. Christian Fraser is in London. Our top stories. It's 50 years to the day since Apollo 11 and the trio of astronauts blasted off into history. We crew felt the uh, weight of the world on our shoulders. Uh, we knew that everyone would be looking at us, friend or foe. President Trump lashes out again at minority lawmakers as the House prepares to condemn his racist tweets. And coming up on the rest of the programme, can Facebook be trusted to run a cryptocurrency? Libra is scheduled for rollout in 2020, but the company faces an uphill battle in the US Congress. <laughs> And meet Cookie. Yep, this is serious. The penguin who loves apparently a good tickle. We will have that story. <laughs> We all love a good tickle. In Washington, in a few hours' time, the House of Representatives will vote on a formal resolution condemning President Trump's racist tweets about four Democratic Congresswomen. The Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, will force Republicans to go on record as either condemning or condoning the President's behaviour. It's the moment, say Democrats, for people to speak out. Maybe even a time for former Presidents to speak out. Yeah, in today's Washington Post, national political correspondent Karen Tumulty writes an open letter to President Barack Obama. And in it, she says this, for Trump, racism is not a moral failing. It is a political tactic. None of us can really claim to understand what is in his heart. But the cynicism of his actions is apparent and it must be exposed for what it is. She calls on the former president to break with tradition and denounce the current occupant of the White House. Karen Tumulty joins us now from the Washington Post's newsroom. Karen, thanks for joining us. What can President Obama, in your mind, achieve by denouncing Donald Trump at this moment? You know, I don't even necessarily think that denouncing Donald Trump is exactly what needs to be done here. For one thing, Barack Obama holds a special place in our history. And he also has a particular history with Donald Trump. The kind of racism that we have seen out of the current, the current president it had a gateway drug, and that was the birtherism, the, the fact that Donald Trump rose to prominence in conservative politics by spreading the lie that Barack Obama had not been born in this country. It's, it, it, so many of the other racist things that he has done since then ha, are, are, all grow from that original sin. So there is the personal history that Barack Obama has with this kind of tactic. But beyond that, and what I think is even more important, is that Barack Obama is a reminder of how this country was able to feel 11 summers ago as it stood on the verge of electing its first African-American president. People had their political differences. There were a lot of people who disagreed with him, but people really did feel that this country was looking forward, that it was putting the sins of its past behind it. And it would be wonderful if, if President Obama could, could once again kind of step into this moment and remind us of what we believed we were capable of just barely over a decade but, ago. But Karen, there are so many transgressions that President uh, Obama could have weighed in on, and it, clearly he is sticking to the convention, uh, long observed, that you don't criticize your successor. He, he is doing that. And the fact is that that is a norm that most ex-presidents have followed. I mean, I personally would like to see a joint statement of Barack Obama and George W. Bush. Uh, former President Carter has certainly spoken up. Um, however, this president, President Trump, has so shattered 
so many of the norms that, that we have taken for granted that I think at this point, the moment itself is so extraordinary that it does call for the kind of leadership that, that the men who have run this country in the past can show at, at this moment, both as, as leaders and also as sort of our, you know, our, our moral lodestars, uh, the, the keepers of their own legacies. Karen, have you been surprised by the degree to which Republicans, perhaps not those who are elected at the moment because they seem to be afraid of Donald Trump and the impact he might have on their electoral prospects, but Republican figures outside, people like Jeb Bush, the Bush family, are you surprised that some of them have not weighed in more forcefully on this occasion? Um, I think at this point, the, the Republican Party, I, it's it has so become the party of Donald Trump that you have to, I'm sure that they wonder themselves what difference it would make. That the people who have spoken up against Trump, uh, even such revered figures as John McCain, have found themselves attacked for it and have had their own patriotism, their own Americanism attacked for it. Um, the Republican Party right now is just a wholly owned subsidiary of Donald Trump's worldview. Okay, Karen Tumulty, thank you um, very much for joining us. And there was another instance of this, another member of the Trump administration, Kellyanne Conway, speaking just a couple of hours ago on the White House to a reporter. It's worth playing what she said because this idea of ethnicity and race and where people come from seems to be something that the White House wants to talk about quite a bit at the moment. Congresswomen returned to their supposed countries of origin. To which countries was he referring? What's your ethnicity? Uh, why is that relevant? No, no, because I'm asking you a question. I'm not sure how that's relevant, but the, the, the journalist who she was asking the question of is Alan Feinberg, who is Jewish. Um, why, would, why would you ask a question like that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what she was trying to get out of that. Maybe she was just trying to say it's okay to ask everybody what their ethnicity is. As Karen was suggesting, this is a departure from the norms. It is quite shocking to hear Kellyanne ask that of a reporter. I mean, I, I don't know how often reporters well, well, on the front Where does this leave? Do, do the Democrats benefit from, from all this, Cathy? So I think there's a moment of unity uh, and this resolution and this vote, it gives Nancy Pelosi the chance to say, look, we are going to do something and we are going to stand together after a summer in which they've been pretty divided, frankly, over a whole load of issues uh, within the Democratic caucus. Whether that lasts, I don't know. And there is a risk, and it's ironic to hear the four congresswomen giving a press conference last night in which they said, we should not be distracted by Donald Trump talking about race. We should be talking about the issues and the policies that Americans care about but they're standing there talking at a press conference about it and what have we been speaking about for the last 48 hours Donald Trump's tweets Mr Trump clearly thinks this benefits him electorally I think uh, there is now a moment of unity for Democrats but there is some peril for them as well uh, mm. that he has picked up on on the party being associated with words like socialism um, erroneously or not he manages to do that and that's perhaps not where they want to be particularly if they want to keep on uh, holding the House of Representatives. Enough American politics, let's get back to space. Much more jolly in 1961, the year John F. Kennedy formally announced Apollo. NASA spent a million dollars on the program in the first year. Five years later, NASA was spending one million dollars every three hours, one million dollars every three hours. The Apollo space program was as much a political risk as it was a technical one. And there were plenty of people here in the US who were opposed to it. The space race had everything to do, of course, with the politics of the time. In 1957, the Soviet Union had sent Sputnik into space and in Washington, the alarm bells were ringing. JFK saw the potential in putting a man on the moon. The complexities of Cold War statesmanship reduced to a simple contest. The Americans reached their goal without conquering the moon or capturing it. They landed and in those four days, the world went with them. David Silito has been looking back at how it played here in the UK. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. Here it goes. Here goes the Mesa with a television camera on it. This is the story of what landing on the moon meant to us. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Home movies, scrapbooks, 
photos, a national memory bank of this where were you moment. This man of the moon, eh? And of the hundreds of contributors, we've been speaking to three of them. I'm with my parents and all of the um, school children at my junior school. There is Armstrong. It's just myself on the left chair, my dad on the right, looking at the television. You were thinking, I've never been up this late, you know, it's like four o'clock in the morning. The children got very bored and they were getting up and running around and I'm dodging, trying to see. And I'm getting so frustrated with this, I burst into tears. Everything about the mission has gone so perfectly that a mid-course correction due early tomorrow morning... And the BBC's man in the studio was James Burke filling time without pictures for more than four hours. The atmosphere is quite tense because it was something you got one go at. If you got it wrong, you got it completely wrong. You can just make out the backpack and the dark circle of the visor in front of it. And I had horror dreams the night before that he'd be walking down the steps and he'd open his mouth to say something and I would say something on top of it. But perhaps the most important thing was just the sheer spectacle of it. The world was watching this demonstration of science and engineering, and for a generation of young viewers, it was inspirational. I knew at that point that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be involved in that side of life, those programmes. I think you can talk to an awful lot of people from my generation and, and later who were inspired. These are the Apollo stories from Britain's living rooms, an archive of memories, inspiration and feelings. I just thought it was the start of bases on the moon leading to the bases on Mars. Um, it turned out to be a bit different to that. And Jackie? Um, it inspired me, but I was in the situation that the best that I could aspire to was to be a, a clerk typist. Fifty years on, she's now a professional space artist. So I always knew I would be an outsider of science, but I was determined despite that I had to get in there somehow, and I did. However, a lot of the TV coverage has been lost. Much of the BBC commentary hasn't survived. Thankfully, one eager 12-year-old was recording it at home. Aldrin coming out. And young Philip Longdon even added his own moon commentary. Eagle taking off the moon. David Solito, BBC News. Well, watching here in the United States back then was a little eight-year-old boy called Leroy Chow. It so inspired him what he saw on television that later in life he would become a NASA astronaut and an International Space Station commander. I'm glad to say he's with us live now from Houston. Leroy, great to have you on today. Do you remember the moment you were watching? Oh, absolutely. I remember very clearly uh, I grew up out in California, not too far from San Francisco, and very warm summer day, the uh, afternoon of the landing. And my dad had moved the old black and white TV set out and I had some friends over and, and we were just watching in awe as the scene unfolded in the Mission Control Center. And then we heard those uh, famous words that they had actually landed on the moon. And I think the landing actually impressed me more than the walk because to me that was the hard part. Once they had landed, we, we, everyone knew they were gonna go outside and, and walk. But uh, nonetheless, watching them walk, uh, that's what inspired me and started my dream of wanting to become an astronaut myself. And you have pushed the boundaries ever since. I imagine the astronaut family is quite a small, tight-knit family. Did you speak to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin before you set off on your voyage? I did not. I did get to meet Neil once very briefly in the halls of the astronaut office when I was already at NASA, and he was coming in for his annual physical, and he you know, normally kept to himself and didn't come up and visit. But from that day, for some reason, he was up there, and I, and I did get to meet him briefly in the hall. Uh, Buzz Aldrin was around much more often, and I've, I've become friends with Buzz, and I've known him for a number of years now. So uh, it's really quite a privilege and an honor to meet your own heroes that you had when you were a boy and then actually follow uh, in their footsteps. Yeah, quite. Um, one of the British contributors to David's report that we just watched said, I thought it was the start of bases on the moon, bases on Mars, and it wasn't. Challenger and Columbia came and went, and we've not been back. Where are we with that, and what could we do if we return to the moon? Well, it's true. Back then, we all thought that by 20 years from 1969, certainly by 1990, 
we would not only have bases on the moon, we would have explored Mars already. And of course, none of that came to pass because as we all have come to understand, the Apollo program was all about the race against the Soviet Union to show that our technology was better and that we could go off and do this. And we spent uh, enormous sums of money. At, at one point, we were spending uh, some, somewhere more than 5% of the U.S. budget on the Apollo program, and we got it done. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but today, there has been a push to go back to the moon. Uh, we need to see the money arrive. Uh, there's been a shakeup recently at NASA headquarters, which uh, <clears throat> frankly has a lot of us scratching our heads a little bit. But if we do go back to the moon, it would be the precursor for going to Mars. The idea is that the moon is close to the Earth. It's only three or four days away. So it's the perfect place to develop all of your things that you need, things like habitats, rovers, spacesuits. Mm -hmm. It's a place to train your astronauts. You don't necessarily want the first crew going to Mars to have no experience in right. that kind of environment. Yeah, the slingshot to the moon. Maybe it'll inspire people, the celebrations today. Leroy, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you very much for being Hi. with us. Our team has set up, because we think we're experts, a little quiz for us, Cutty. Shall we rattle through it? It's on the Newsround yeah. website. I've it's been on the BBC this. website, so if you go want on. to test. Cutty K, you have 90, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Here we go. Uh, right, so uh, NASA missions are given particular names. Do you know the name of the moon landing mission? Yes, Apollo 11. Right. What was the name of the rocket that launched the NASA astronauts Saturn V? Are you going to join in, Cathy? Yeah, we just heard Saturn V. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't see. The screen is far too small for me. My eyes are too blurry. I thought you were phoning a friend. ringing Jane Carry at on. Cape Canaveral. <laughs> what was the I name of the rocket that on. launched the NASA astronauts into space? We've done that one. What was the f who was the first man to walk on the moon? Neil, Neil Armstrong. Armstrong. There we yeah. go. OK. Uh, Thank God for this. Yeah. How long did the mission take? Four de uh, six days. I thought it was six four days. days. Six. Oh, so they had to get back again. What? Oh, no, what you could we have failed. Won. Yep. Uh, what year did a man first <laughs> Where walk is on Jane the moon? 1969. 1969. I'm giving you all the answers here. Oh, no, I got How there far first. You're just going too fast. I think you put that in our queue. Is it 240,000 miles? Yeah, I don't know. It's got to be more is. than that, Christian Fraser. I think it's 240,000 miles. Yeah. Come on. How many did I get? Oh, there's another Dead one. It. What was the name of the ship that landed on the moon? Falcon. The Eagle. Eagle. Can I change my answer? Eagle. All right, yeah. Last one. Which US president okay. spoke to the astronauts when they were on the moon? President Kennedy. Nixon. Oh, no, sorry. Was in, in, was in office when they were on the moon. Nixon. God, it's a good job I'm here. Oh. Go on, then. Yeah. Yeah, we only got one wrong. Nixon, because Kennedy was bad, dead by know. then. They might let us stay. Not bad. Eight out of nine. <laughs> I, I did say that if Stefan embarrassed us, he was going to be fired. So, you know, <laughs> lucky you actually think we the easy right ones. there. Okie dokie, moving swiftly along from our woeful ignorance, there are few issues that can unite American lawmakers from both sides of the political aisle. Suspicion of Facebook, however is one of them. Earlier today, senators from both parties grilled Facebook about its latest venture, Libra. That's the digital currency that it's planning to unveil in 2020. When Facebook announced its new cryptocurrency last month, it promised greater access to basic financial services for anyone with an internet connection. But since then, its plans have drawn intense security from financial regulators and politicians alike. Scrutiny, I think that should be. Libra's. Yeah, absolutely. Intense Libra's co-creator um, promised the Senate Finance Committee that Facebook won't launch the currency without a green light first. And let's speak now to Dave Lee, the BBC Silicon Valley reporter. He is uh, with us. Dave, um, so we've got Democrats there saying that they, why should anyone trust Facebook with their cryptocurrency? fair point after everything to do with elections, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. There's two issues here at play, I think. One is uh, mistrust of cryptocurrencies in general. We've seen Bitcoin, of course, be used for all sorts of illegal activity. The price goes up and down. It's, there's so, uh, security problems with Bitcoin. So that in itself is a problem. But then for Facebook to be doing this 
adds another layer of complexity. This is a group of senators, and indeed much of the population right now is looking at Facebook and saying, clean up your own issues that you already have before perhaps going on to something that could be very complex, very new, and have a whole new load of risks on top. And that's what the hearing was about. It was about Facebook answering some of those questions. How will it be regulated? Mm -hmm. uh, how will you protect against fraud? How will you stop it being used for illegal purposes? A lot of questions to answer. Today, I think, was step one on a long process. Dave, with your social media hat on, I, I just want to throw you a, a different theme, and this is about Twitter and carrying Donald Trump's tweets. It's come in for a lot of criticism in the last 24 hours because it, it did tell us two weeks ago that it was going to leave the tweets of politicians up because they are relevant in the greater debate, but it was going to flag them, and it hasn't flagged these tweets. Why not? It hasn't said why not, Christian, which is what's getting many people who observe this kind of these policies uh, quite confused. As you say, Twitter uh, earlier this year said that um, while sometimes uh, statements from world leaders on Twitter could be against their policies had they just been a, a normal user, um, they would leave them up because they're relevant to the debates in those countries and indeed globally. But then what they did come up with was a system where they said, well, if we wouldn't remove them, we'd at least add a tag so that our users could know that they were against those policies. Now, this was the first real test of that. The president's tweets at the weekend really put the onus on Twitter to look at whether that applied to President Trump's tweets. And in the first test of this, as I say, uh, Twitter decided that wasn't the case. Now, they haven't given explicit reason for that. And so yet again, uh, Twitter's under fire here for uh, inconsistent uh, application of its policies. Right. But say. if they did tag them or take them down in any way, you can just see the reaction from the White House. It would be, as we saw at that summit last week, that Twitter and social media are liberal leaning. Yes, absolutely. And one of the big questions to tech companies this week, which is to, well, at Google this week, but it will come to Twitter eventually, is to what extent uh, politicians on the right here in America feel that their views are being uh, restricted or hidden by these big companies. And so if Twitter had have taken that step, yeah, you're right, they would have come under a lot of scrutiny uh, of that accusation that conservative voices aren't welcomed by these companies out of Silicon Valley, out of liberal Silicon Valley, uh, and that voices on the left are given more freedom. Um, but in this instance, I don't think Twitter really, they can't please everyone, can okay. they? Dave, good to have you here in Washington, get you out of Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, Safa and Mawa Biwi were born joined at the skull, never able to see each other's faces. There are no official figures for how often this happens, but it is thought to occur as rarely as once in every two and a half million births. Most babies conjoined in this way survive barely one day. Saving the lives of the two-year-old sisters has required multiple surgeries, months of hard work and the expertise of hundreds. Fergus Walsh has been following the extraordinary story of their treatment. Safa and Marwa share a single skull. The two-year-olds have already undergone two complex operations at Great Ormond Street Hospital to prepare them for separation. Now, finally, that day has come. Two whole brains laid out. Their brains, locked together since birth, are eased apart. After three major operations, the twins are no longer joined. Wow, goodness knows where you start with that, but let's find out. We're joined by the neurosurgeon who performed uh, the life-changing operation, Awais uh, Jelani. Uh, Mr. Jelani, Professor Jelani, I, I presume. Um, very good to have you with us. Um, I was reading today about how you did this. So you separate the two brains without separating the heads. You're, you're doing it internally. And while you're doing this, you're clumping certain blood vessels. How do you know that you're clumping the right ones? Um, well, uh, we don't. So it's, um, it's at best an educated guess based on our previous experience and the experience of others. Um, we study the, the anatomy, the brains, the vascular anatomy in quite a bit of detail. And then um, it's a best uh, guess estimate in terms of what we should do and which vessels we clamp at what stage. The whole idea is to do it in a staged fashion. So the surgical insult is uh, relatively limited and small, and the children have a chance to recuperate between the various stages. You did create a VR model, though, uh, to get as, as close as you could before the operation to know what you were going into. But there was one moment during the surgery where you thought you might lose one or other of the girls. What happened? Uh, that is correct, yes. So. The first surgery went to plan. Um, the second surgery was uh, different. 
we encountered a lot of um, venous bleeding. The venous pressure was high, so there was quite a lot of bleeding throughout the surgery. The surgery itself um, was much longer than what we had anticipated. And during the surgery, there were periods when one of the twins was quite unstable um, and we were close to losing her. So that was quite a, quite a difficult uh, position to be in for the girls and for the team uh, looking after them. And where are we at now with their rehabilitation? So the separation's done. They're two independent girls. Um, they've clearly been through a lot over the past 10 months since they came to us. Uh, but they're making very good progress. Um, so the hope is that over the coming months with intensive rehabilitation, that progress will continue. And hopefully at the end of it, we'll have two independent um, functioning girls. Well, always Jelani, it Jelani. is incredible what you've done. Uh, many, many congratulations. Fantastic. And we wish you the best with uh, their care into the future. Thank you very much. Um, now for something really different. Uh, here we go. You learn something new on this programme every day, particularly facts about furry animals. Yeah, not only does it turn out that penguins love to be tickled, but also they have one of the strangest laughs in the entire animal kingdom. This is Cookie, a little penguin from Cincinnati Zoo. Take a listen to this clip that's recently resurfaced. <laughs> that is a penguin giggle. Did you know that penguins giggle? Um, Ooh, just behind no, the head. I did just not. behind the head. <laughs> Okay. Uh, apparently a director used to be called Cookie at School, he's just been telling me. So for all of those who are nicknamed Cookie yeah, at School and, and like a good tickle, that telling us where he liked story to be was for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, OK. The, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have, I have, not I have nothing more. We've got about 30 seconds left on the programme and I bet you've got a penguin pun in you somewhere. <laughs> OK. Uh, no. no. <laughs> Ross Atkins is coming up on World News. I'm just going to move away <laughs> from tickling. And that... Is a black and white news show. <laughs> Get it? Black and white. Come on, wasn't that bad?